Good afternoon, and on behalf of the Association for Vascular Access and the I Save That webinar series, I welcome you to our presentation today, Intraosseous Access, the Proximal Humerus Advantage. A special thanks to this webinar sponsor, Teleflex Medical. Ava is dedicated to providing you with informative content from experts in the industry of vascular access. I'm Blake Hotchkiss in the Ava Education Department, joined with me today by Judy Thompson, Director of Education at the Association for Vascular Access. I have here looking at 900 plus intraosseous vascular access research articles, 300 plus clinical articles that are specific to um, the powered IO device system and many clinical studies and trials. Um, and while, um, while we're talking, there's probably even one more research article written. I think since January, there have been more than a dozen um, articles written on intraosseous access as a whole. So there's really a widespread utilization of intraosseous access um, as used in that vascular access algorithm that you use um, um, and as part of your toolbox when you're thinking about vascular access for your patient. So we're going to talk a uh, review. Um, by, I think about four or five research um, articles here, a couple of, of, of literature that we're going to go over. And the first and this study is um, important because it really discussed first attempt success rates for the proximal humerus in particular. And we're talking about the proximal humerus. patients and the power uh, driven IO was used for this study and they had a first attempt success rate of 91%. This study also important to, um, to note is that this um, study was a pre-hospital study so it was EMS clients, paramedics and they received education from the vendor of that power IO and they also used that device the um, per manufacturer's recommendations using the stabilizer and they documented in their study that they stabilized the extremity and that's important because they did not have any serious complications and they had a, a low rate of dislodgement for those proximal humerus IOs. That's kind of in um, direct correlation to this study. This is the Reed study and they were also looking at first attempt success rates for intraosseous access. They were comparing the difference between the proximal humerus IOs and the tibial sites. And that's more, most often going to be the proximal tibia site, not the distal tibia site. And they looked at 88 cardiac arrest patients. So they had a similar um, patient population. They just had a smaller uh, patient size. And what they saw was that uh, um, 58 and 30 of those IO attempts success were in the tibia and humerus respe respectively. So they had more tibia than they had humerus. Um, and what they found was in the humerus, they had a low 60% proximal humerus size and they had a higher 90% success rate in that tibia site. Um, and in the proximal humerus, they also had a, a fairly significantly high 33% dislodgement rate with only a 6% dislodgement rate in the tibia. Um, and the difference in this study is that they um, provided their own in-house education. They did their um, at their um, at their EMS agency. They did not have the manufacturer come in. They also in their study did not document that they used any securement device. Humerus site is recommended by most manufacturers of, of adult IOs or IOs that you can use in the proximal humerus site. So, um, you know, it's interesting when I read this study and I see that the tibia has a higher success rate than the proximal humerus because when we think about our muscle memory, and our career memory of, of, of intraosseous access, most of us think about using the IO in pediatric patients and that immediately brings them. And so we've been using that site for a longer period of time than we've been using the proximal humerus. So, um, you know, it might take a, a little more education to get our comfort level as high as it is in the tibia, but I think it's well worth it. When we talk about the benefits of the proximal yeah. humerus, I, I think that you'll feel the same way. Oops, I did one, one click too many. Here is the Ross study. So in this study, they looked at uh, time to epinephrine and out of 
hospital cardiac arrest patients. And uh, they had they did a res retrospective analysis of intraosseous versus intravenous. And I'm going to talk about this study, and then I'm going to talk about a more recent study called the Paramedic 2 study that um, was not published when I wrote this. Um, in this study, they really looked at um, out of um, in that intraosseous re versus intravenous. And this was a three-year retrospective study. And the proximal humerus was the most um, used IO site, and it had a really high first-time success rate. And it also had the proximal humerus had a lower complication rate than the tibia. Overall, intraosseous access has a has a very low um, complication, serious complication rate. The powered IO system has a less than 1% serious complication rate. Um, and you can refer to other manufacturers for what their complications rates are, rates are but, but it is very low on the spectrum of complications. Um, but the time to epinephrine, uh, administration of epinephrine was faster in the IO group than in the peripheral IV route. Um, so there's a, there's a, more recent study out that is called the Paramedic 2 study out of the UK. And, and there've been several studies out looking at peripheral um, IV access versus intraosseous access. And, and the issue with some of those studies is that it, it puts the proximal tibia IO against an upper arm IV, like an antecubital placed peripheral IV. And those aren't really similar anatomical locations. So the Paramedic 2 study looked at proximal humerus IOs versus in the upper arm, so or in the antecube of the arm. So those are more similar, lo similar locations. And what they found um, was very similar um, um, success rates with um, with administration of epinephrine and also those patients um, in the study they had similar um, um, success rates for leaving the hospital and having um, good neurologic outcomes so really found that that the IV and the proximal humerus IO were very similar in those comparisons this is the Barnard study and it's uh, was published in 2014, and they really evaluated the use of intraosseous vascular access um, for the delivery of RSI medications. And this study is important. It's a very small patient um, group of 34 patients, but it was in a combat hospital in Afghanistan. Access was established in either the proximal humerus, the tibia, or the sternal Sites, and all attempts were um, successful on the first attempt, and they had a first pass intubation success rate of 97%. So when you're in that type of environment, taking those taking care of those types of trauma patients, you can imagine that you really want to get that airway as quick as possible. And when you've got a Cormac Lehane score of grade one for 91% of your patients, getting those medications in quick. is really important and that was achieved in the proximal humerus IO. Two more studies. This one's the Philbeck study, um, Philbeck et al. And it was um, a study that was um, sponsored by the manufacturer um, and trying to find out how much medication needed to be delivered and how slowly into the intraosseous medullary space so that we could um, um, really mitigate the pain or help um, Delay, uh, detour some of the pain away from that sense. So we want to try and help that um, um, when able. A patient has time for this medication delivery, and it was discovered that if you delivered 60 milligrams of 2% preservative free and epidemic um, an epinephrine-free lidocaine, that 2% pink box lidocaine, um, very slowly. The first dose, which is 40 milligrams over two minutes, um, followed by by one minute dwell and then the next 20 and then give a vigorous flush. Some of the pain, there um, is always going to be a little bit of pain, um, but it does help that pain during the IO infusion. That study can be found um, um, if You can find the reference for all these studies, and I know that this one is um, free for download online, and it's it's a wonderful read. All right, Blake, I'm ready for my first poll. All 
are you aware of the most recent IO position statements for nurses from INS and ENA? So yes or no. All right. Well, it's 70-30. No. People well, are then I'm not. glad that I brought it up today, Blake. Uh, so no, so you guys should um, head on over to the INS or the ENA website and um, and take and review that that publication. It's a, it's a beautiful uh, publication that discusses the use of intraosseous access and what types of patients and um, and that was um, published, of course, by the societies and um, read and should probably become part of um, of your um, policy statement and your um, references in any of your policy statements that you use for IO access. And that that really melds well into this evidence-based care slide that we have. So we just talked about how global leaders are supporting the use of intraosseous vascular access um, as an, an important tool in your toolbox. Um, but you may not realize there's a significant amount, a significant body of evidence related to intraosseous access specifically. There are over 900 intraosseous vascular access research articles um, and 90 studies and clinical trials and, and thousands of patients study. There's a recent study that I really want to uh, give your attention to, and that's a study um, or really a position statement put out by ENA and INS um, conjoint, um, jointly. And that study is called The Role of the Registered Nurse in the Use of Intraosseous uh, Access Devices. And in that study, they discussed that an RN that is trained in the use of IO access may insert, maintain, uh, assess, manage, and um, remove that IO access. So that's a really important document that is a, a 20 that has recently been published. I encourage you to go on either the ENA or INS website and download that document for free and read it. It a, has a lot of uh, really good background on the history that we just discussed and a lot of literature that supports the use of intraosseous access. We're going to go through a few studies that support the use of IO access um, before we start talking um, about uh, how to place and our time to heart and time to fluids, uh, fluids and medications. The first one we want to talk about is Wampler. So the Wampler study is an important study um, and it discussed first attempt success rates for humerus uh, in the pre-hospital patient population. And as you can see, there were 247 cardiac arrest patients studied, and there were no serious complications with this study. As you can see, they had a first attempt success rate in the proximal humerus uh, of 91% with this study. Uh, and they used the power driver for this study. Uh, it's interesting, uh, and we'll talk about um, the next study, and this is what makes it important, is that the Wampler study uh, they received education um, that was industry supported, and so they had education from industry experts, and they used the IO system of choice um, as it was designed to be used. They used a securement device that was designed to be used with that IO, and they also secured the extremity. And as we go through this presentation and we talk about the proximal humerus as an IO site, you'll hear me say a couple of times that it's really... Um, um, important to secure the arm, especially if you think there's going to be movement if the patient's alert or if you're in the pre-hospital environment or in the emergency room, if you're taking your patient uh, for um, a study somewhere in the hospital and the arm has a chance to move, um, it's important to secure the extremity. And we'll talk about that a little bit more um, in a little bit. So this study um, um, is a little bit different than the Wampler study. It's built very similar. The Reed study looked at 88 cardiac arrest patients and they um, inserted in the proximal humerus and the tibia. So they had 58 attempts were made into the tibia and 30 into the humerus respectively. Um, and that's important because they had really low first attempt success rates in the proximal humerus. They had a 60% first attempt success rate in the proximal humerus, and the tibia had a 90% first attempt success rate. And I wonder if that's because 
you know, going back to, you know, we really think of intraosseous access first in pediatrics. You know, I first learned about IO access in the PALS class, and I've been providing IO access in the pediatric patient population for many more years than I have as adults. And the tibia really brings across that uh, legacy knowledge of how to insert into the tibia. And I was able to effectively apply that to the adult population easily. But when I learned the proximal humors, that was a, that was a new skill. So that may feed into some of those higher success rates for this study. Also in this study, um, the paramedics that provided IO access um, for the Reed study did not receive um, industry supported expert level um, clinical education before the study began. And so um, that's important for you to reach out to whoever your vendor is for IO access and ensure that you are landmarking um, per their suggestions and uh, per industry standards. So uh, very important to do that. Make sure you have education up front before you provide any medical procedure. Um, also, they had a pretty high dislodgement rate. So in the proximal humerus, they had a 33% dislodgement rate. And in the tibia, they only had a 6% uh, displacement dislodgement rate. And they did not document any use of um, a stabilization device for the catheter itself or for the extremity in the proximal humerus. And the tibia doesn't require any stabilization, but as, as I said, we like to have the proximal humerus, that arm secured in place, and there's no report of that in the study. So no, educa no education um, from their provider of IO access, and the system wasn't fully used it was, as it was intended to be used, and the extremity was not secured. So, uh, so now we all know we need to get our education, we need to secure the device and secure the extremity. The Ross study is important. It talks about um, time to epinephrine in and out of hospital uh, and cardiac arrest patients. And I'm gonna review this study and then I'm gonna talk about a more recent study that came out um, after I developed this presentation. So this presentation talked about uh, out of hospital time epinephrine using the IO route compared to the peripheral intravenous access route. And they used three years of retrospective data. And what they found was the proximal humerus was the most used IO site with a first time success rate of 95.6%. That's a really high success rate. And the proximal humerus had a lower complication rate than the tibia. And even though they did document a handful of complications, none of them were serious complications that required um, long-term treatment. Uh, but they did find that time to administration of epinephrine was faster in the IO group than the peripheral IV group. Uh, we know that we can place intraosseous access in seconds and that there are many studies that show peripheral IV access. Um, it can take upwards of nine to 18 minutes to perform, to provide peripheral IV access. And there's a recent study that shows if you use ultrasound guided peripheral IV access, that can add 13 minutes to your peripheral IV access um, procedure. There's a more recent study called the Paramedic 2 study. It's available free for download online, and it's, uh, the author of that is Nolan et al. I encourage you to pull that Paramedic 2 study out of the UK, and it was published within the last few months. That study is really important because you'll see um, several um, time to epinephrine studies um, out now that you can download and read. The importance is to look at where the peripheral IV is and where the intraosseous catheter or cannula is. And many times in those studies, the peripheral IV is in the upper arm or in the antecubital, somewhere in the upper extremity, and the IO is in the tibia, which is, of course, um, further away from the heart. So just anatomically, the peripheral IV has a, a better chance of, of getting your medications to the heart faster. The Paramedic 2 study is important because they looked at um, uh, epinephrine with a peripheral IV access in the upper extremity, so in one of the arms, and they also used a proximal humerus IO. And so what they found was there was no significant difference in return of spontaneous circulation in with epi or placebo in the IO or the IV and that there was no difference in treatment effect between IV and IO roots on long-term outcomes of 30-day survival and favorable neurologic outcomes. So really important when you read those epinephrine studies comparing IV and IO, 
where is the IV and where is the IO, and does that maybe play into the success of the study? The next study is Barnard, and this study evaluated use of IO access for delivery of rapid sequence intubation drugs. And uh, many of you, especially uh, if you're a vascular access nurse that responds with rapid response teams, um, you may be providing the only vascular access that patient has for delivery of emergency medications or for rapid sequence intubation drugs. And if you look at this study, it's really important because the data was collected from 34 patients in a combat hospital in Afghanistan. That that's about as austere as it can get when you've got a trauma patient coming in from a combat situation into a tent hospital with poor lighting you need to gain access very rapidly and your medication needs to work the very first time you give it um, another thing to look at is look at that a cormac lehane score of one was reported in 91% of the time. So they were able to gain access uh, very quickly. Uh, they established it in the proximal humerus, the tibia and the sternal sites. The sternal site is used for military operations quite frequently. All of their IO attempts were successful on the first attempt. So that's a 100% first time success rate for um, all 34 of their patients who received IO access and all of their intubation attempts were successful the first time also. So that's an important study to show you that intraosseous access um, is able to deliver important medications rapidly into the central circulation um, so that you can treat your patients effectively. This last study is uh, Dr. Philbeck et al. And this study was designed to compare lidocaine's effect on pain during fluid infusion through the tibia and humerus sites and, and to determine IO flow rates. So this study did two things. Um, the first uh, thing it did was really ask, how much medication do we need to give? What type of medication? How slow do we need to give it so that we're numbing the inside of the medullary cavity and not providing an systemic effect from lidocaine um, to the patient? And what the study found was a total of 60 milligrams of the pink box 2% preservative free and epinephrine free lidocaine um, can be used and that can be effectively given in two doses. Um, and, the, and you can find this study, fill back, um, Hurt So Good study, I think it's free for download online. Um, otherwise, um, please feel free to contact me after the presentation and I can um, help you find it free online for download. This study showed 40 milligrams given over two minutes and then allowed to dwell in the medullary space for one minute, followed by a rapid normal saline flush of at least uh, 10 mLs and another followed up by that second dose of 20 milligrams of lidocaine over one minute really helps to uh, mitigate the pain um, found with IO infusion because we know IO insertion is about a two to three on a scale of zero to 10. It's the infusion of medications and fluids under pressure that really aggravates the nerve endings inside the medullary cavity, those pressure receptors. And so if we can give this dose to patients who are alert to pain and do not require emergent medical treatment with their IO, um, then we can really um, help ease their pain during IO infusion. And in this study, um, uh, you know, for less overall pain due to IO infusion and greater IO infusion rates, the proximal humerus was shown to be really beneficial. Uh, you use a longer needle set in the proximal humerus. So um, for most IO devices on the market, there are a couple of needle sets that are available. For this study, they used a powered IO device and there are three needle sets available. Um, for the clinician to choose um, using weight-based guidelines and skin tissue depth. And for the proximal humerus, they used um, a 45 millimeter needle set for this study. And they found it beneficial using the longer needle set that could be placed um, um, all the way until the hub was close to the skin. It leaves um, a lot of needle set in the bone. It also provided really high flow rates when um, inserted at the proper angle. And this study found um, when um, the IO was placed with the power driver and the proximal humerus into um, adult patients, uh, healthy volunteers with uh, fluids to pressure, they could gain on average 6.3 liters per hour um, per proximal humerus. We're ready for another 
pole. This one is the North Pole. IO device do you use in clinical practice? Is it a <clears throat> manual driver, a power driver, or a spring-loaded driver? So there's a several different IOs available to providers of vascular access, uh, and most of them fit, in, I think all of them fit into these categories now, manual, power driver, or spring-loaded. And so um, as we move forward, I just wanted to see where everybody was in their clinical practice, so I'll know who I'm speaking to. Awesome. <clears throat> So 87% said power driver, and then it was seven and 6% for manual and spring loaded. Okay, all right, great. Um, so um, that um, definitely lets us know where everybody is on their clinical practice. And here, if I can stop, here um, is a slide that discusses the use of, um, of those three subsets of intraosseous. We know that when we started with intraosseous access, you know, back in the 1920s, as we described um, by Dr. Papper and moved through, those are those are all manual devices. Even in, in the 1980s, when we had a resurgence of IO, um, that came back as a manual and, until um, the power-driven device was established. So the manual um, IO is indicated for use um, in adults and pediatric patients in emergencies, and it can be used in several different sites. The power driver um, is indicated anytime vascular access is difficult or impossible to obtain in medically necessary situations also, so urgent, emergent, and medically necessary situations for up to 24 hours. Um, it's indicated for several more sites, proximal humerus, distal femur, proximal and distal tibia sites. You can use that, um, that power-driven device in patients greater than three kilos. And then those devices are indicated for adult and pediatric patients in emergencies, uh, and they can be used and also in several different sites. Um, so if you're not using the power driver, I encourage you to um, review your main or even if you are using the power driver I encourage you to, to encourage you to use refer to your manufacturer's instructions for how you can use that device more, more robustly um, and reach out to the clinical um, for those different devices and ensure that your policy is up to date so that you're using that device to its fullest so how are we going to use an intraosseous device and what type of clinical consideration should we think about for use of the IO and really, uh, you can use it for any patient that you deem necessary. You should be using some sort of vascular access algorithm um, for use of any vascular access device. And when you're thinking about IO, you need to ask yourself, uh, do I need emergent access right now? And if that answer is yes, really you're thinking about IO or peripheral IV. And if you think the peripheral IV is going to be difficult, um, then, then you should likely think about the IO as a bridge to um, another form of vascular access, which may be that peripheral IV, especially if you need to use an adjunct like ultrasound. Um, and that ultrasound, of course, requires a skilled clinician. And there's a recent article out that shows that if you're going to use ultrasound, even with a skilled clinician, it can take up to 13 minutes to um, obtain that type of vascular access by ultrasound, that peripheral access. If you don't need emergent access, then look at all the different clinical considerations on the screen. Uh, sepsis, trauma, burns. I mean, I think about patients who have obstetrical emergencies, um, uh, the diabetic ketoacidosis, uh, sickle cell crisis. When I think about patients like that, I think about long-term vascular access that is likely longer than a peripheral IV is going to be needed for that patient or is going to hold that patient through, and, and maybe medications that are going to be too caustic for delivery through a peripheral IV. So uh, and that's another time that intraosseous access is a great bridge to a more definitive line. And I also really love the thought of that interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary medical team coming together during that intraosseous dwell, that bridge time, and saying, you know, what line is going to take my patient through their hospital stay so I don't go peripheral IV to peripheral IV to central line to pick line to whatever else the next line is. Let's put one line in that's going to be great for this patient um, and decrease that risk of, um, of complications that can occur when you have multiple line placement. 
So for intraosseous vascular access with the power-driven IO, it provides access for adult and pediatric patients when IV access is difficult to obtain in emergent, urgent, or medically necessary cases for up to 24 hours in the U.S. and up to 72 hours for those of you who've joined us from the EU today, if there are any. Uh, contraindications, this is pretty much across the board for uh, most intraosseous access devices, uh, but for the power-driven device, you'll notice what's not on our contraindication list is soft bones, and that is listed for some other IO devices. For, um, for the power-driven device, the contraindications are exactly what you see on the screen. Fracture of the target bone, infection at the area of insertion, inability to identify the landmarks, IO or attempted IO access in the target bone within the previous 48 hours, prosthesis or orthopedic um, um, procedure near the insertion site. And these may seem pretty straightforward, but when you think about that prosthesis or orthopedic procedure near the insertion site, surgeons are getting really good at making those scars thinner and lighter. So we need to be really careful about looking at those sites. And if you see a scar there, um, then likely you should just steer away from that site and go to another area for landmarking. Fracture of the target bone and a previous IO site within the last 48 hours that you've removed within the last 48 hours, those are similar. If you insert into a, the same bone of a previous site uh, within the last 48 hours or fracture the target bone, there's a chance that fluids and medication you administer through the new site may leak out of one of those disruptions in the cortex. And that can lead to an infiltration or an extravasation, and that can lead to compartment syndrome. So we want to stay away from those sites. Infection at the area of insertion is similar to um, other vascular access devices. You wouldn't want to insert through there. That's a general contraindication. And then inability to identify the landmarks. Many of you are thinking about bariatric patients, but in actuality, those patients, when you lie them back on a flat surface, that soft tissue usually falls back to the posterior surface as well, leaving the proximal humerus site easily um, identifiable to landmark. I think about patients who have a lot of musculature over their upper extremity with the proximal humerus site in particular, and I also think about pediatric patients. That greater tubercle of the proximal humerus is a calcification that it forms over time. It's not there at birth, and that's what helps develop that surgical neck of the proximal humerus. And as you, when we go through landmarking, you'll see that surgical neck is going to be um, our landmark target. So if you're unable to locate that surgical neck of the proximal humerus that you're not going to find in infants and toddlers, you'll find it going on into school age children. If you can't find that, then you need to move to another site. So what are some of the advantages of the proximal humerus? As you can see in, um, in the power device, we have eight uh, six sites in adults and eight sites in pediatric patients. We have bilateral proximal humerus, bilateral proximal tibia, and bilateral distal tibia. For the pediatric patient, we're going to add in bilateral distal femur. And so what are the advantages of the proximal humerus site? What makes it so much more advantageous? And if you look at it on this picture, you can see it's just closer to the heart. And so um, with this site, we're gonna obtain um, three, less than three seconds to the heart with our medications and fluid. Also in a healthy human volunteer study with fluids under pressure on average, flow rates um, were achieved at 6.3 liters per hour. And that is in direct correlation to the proximal tibia where in the same patient population in the same study, they were able to achieve one liter per hour uh, for fluids under pressure. And if you think about the volumes of fluid you're gonna wanna give in um, let's say a sepsis patient. So if I were a sepsis patient and my blood pressure were low, was low and my lactate was greater than four, you're gonna to wanna to give me a fluid bolus, right? And you're gonna to wanna to give me 30 per kilo. That's in that one hour bundle now for sepsis. And if I were gonna get that, that would, be, that would be two liters of fluid that you needed to give me. Do you wanna give it over an hour or two hours or do you wanna give it over 20 minutes? That's the difference between the proximal humerus and the proximal tibia site. Also um, in that, um, in a recent, in, in the same similar patient population, um, lower insertion and infu infusion pain um, was documented in the proximal humerus site, and there was less medication required for pain management. So the proximal humerus site, um, of course, is going to be in a long bone, and we like to insert um, into the long bones 
into the uh, proximal and distal ends of long bones, specifically in, into the epiphysis of those long bones. And as we know, the end of the bone is called the epiphysis and the middle is called the diaphysis. In the epiphysis, you'll see in that um, image to the left where that um, yellow 45 millimeter IO is sitting, um, that is a nicely, um, it's a nice highly vascular non-collapsible access. The bone is, is that space is encapsulated in bone. So when your patient has a low blood pressure or um, it, their heart is not beating, or they have low blood volume, um, and their vasculature is nowhere to be seen, their peripheral vascular, the bone is always gonna be there. That comes with a little bit of a cost because what is always gonna be there is pressure. So uh, we'll talk about how to um, overcome that pressure um, um, when we talk about uh, care and maintenance uh, and delivery of fluids later on in the presentation. If you look at the circular cutout, you'll see that nice honey comb um, of bone and that's either you, you'll hear it called cancellous bone or you'll hear it called a uh, spongy bone and oftentimes but really it's this trabecular bone that's made out of pistons and rods and it creates this honeycomb effect of bone where the red thick viscous uh, marrow which is very vascular and has a lot of red cells developing in it. Uh, it's embedded in that in that cancellous spongy bone, and you can see it on the bone cut out as well. What that looks like, and that's important because when we access that IO space for the very first time, we need to displace that marrow in the cavity so that we can create a channel or a canal or a pathway for our fluids and medications to reach these canals that you see in the square cut out. So those are the Boltman canals or the Haversian canals. And those canals um, move medication and fluid very rapidly from the medullary space into the central circulation. You know, if you think about the bone and what it's actually in our body for, I mean, the bones are there, of course, to hold up our skeleton, but they make our blood. And those canals are there to move those red, those brand new blood cells from inside the marrow into central circulation. So that system was already in place and ready for us to use it as vascular access. So let's look at this real-time fluoroscopy and you'll see it starting here um, and contrast eye moving from that proximal humerus IO directly into that healthy beating heart in the lower right hand corner and that uh, fluid and medication reaches the heart again in less than three seconds. You can see um, again as it moves through, we'll show it one more time since it's so fast sometimes you'll miss it, um, but that contrast moving very rapidly again from the proximal humerus IO into that beating heart and when you watch that think about the types of medications that you give in an IO when when you um, uh, provide vascular access using an intraosseous catheter and if you use a proximal humerus think about that medication reaching the patient so quickly um, and how that can really change um, the course of your medical treatment. So a lot of times we hear, oh, we don't wanna to go to uh, use the proximal humerus IO because there's just not enough space at the head of the bed. So I challenge you by um, looking at this picture. Um, I, there I am, I'm at B and I'm providing uh, intraosseous access in the proximal humerus. And as you can see, this patient um, is, you know, has a lot of tissue over their proximal humerus, but the yellow 45 millimeter um, um, would have been um, available to provide excellent access for this patient. The person at the A position, the clinician at the A position is waiting to provide chest compressions. Um, we're in the pit crew, C, pit crew CPR positions and our clinician at D is currently providing chest compressions and C is providing an airway. It's interesting because um, with the proximal humerus IO insertion, the best um, angle to come in for insertion is at that 45 degree angle where I'm standing. So the compressor and the airway person actually provide the perfect pie piece for you to come in for that proximal humerus insertion. And also you can think about if I were not standing in that B position and maybe there's only one or two of you providing care, how C can also very easily move into that position or prob provide that proximal humerus IO access or D, either one of you um, at the C or D position could provide IO access, um, but it is easily obtainable when there are other people providing um, life-saving um, 
clinical procedures at the head of the bed. We got the totem pole. Ready for another pole, Blake. That's awesome. That was my favorite. <laughs> All right, here we go. How often do you use the proximal humerus site for IO placement? Zero to 25%, 25 to 50, 50 to 75, or 75 to 100%? I'm curious because I know we have quite a few people joining us today. So I'm curious to see how many of you are using the proximal humerus site. And I really wish we could send this out to you in a couple of weeks after you've had education and you've gained more confidence and ask it again. <laughs> Yeah, pre and post test. The pre and post, <laughs> exactly, the pre and post. All right, closing the poll. And we've got 65% said zero to 25%, and then followed by 75 to 100% was 15%. All right, so not, not surprising, not surprising. You know, we said that um, it's, it's a there's a there's a carryover of of in, uh, there's a carryover of confidence coming um, with the tibia. M many of us have been taking PALS or ACLS for for many many years, and that tibia knowledge, the muscle memory, the legacy knowledge that we have from the tibia rolls over into that adult site, and we have a confidence there. Um, but we just talked about how the proximal humerus site. The, the advantages, how it's so um, advantageous to put that there for your patient and the clinical considerations are significant. So let's go through some landmarking and look at how we can hopefully get your confidence level up. I would like to mention that any education we do um, on a webinar like this, it's important to understand that if you really want to increase your confidence level, you should really partner it with hands-on education. So I encourage you to reach out to um, the manufacturer of your IO device if you feel like you need to increase the confidence level for your team and or your colleagues and ask ask your manufacturer to come in and provide some updates for um, for hands-on education of course when you guys are ready and your hospital is accepting education again during this new time of social distancing so the first thing we're going to do for proximal humerus landmarking, and if you're um, at work or if you're at home and uh, you have a family member there, go ahead and, um, and landmark on someone that's near you that you're able to be um, social around. So the first thing you want to do is you need to add duct and internally rotate the arm. And you can do that one of two ways. You can add duct the arm by putting the arm close to the body with the elbow back and put the hand over the abdomen like you see on the picture. Or you can add duct putting the arm tight and close against the body and then internally rotate the entire arm until the palm is out and the thumb is down. And you'll see, um, I always like to mention that this hand over the abdomen position, it may not be the best position for patients who have a gravid abdomen um, or patients who have um, um, a large body habitus because um, someone who has excess tissue over their abdomen, whether it be from abdominal ascites or um, from pregnancy, that brings the arm away from the body and that takes away from what we're trying to do. Adduction and internal rotation does something very important. When the arm is extended and out and the palm is facing upward, there's a bicipital groove that runs right down through here, through this axilla area. And underneath and near it, there's um, a bundle of nerve, the nerve, the artery, and the vein is there. And so we wouldn't want to go through the tendon, and we don't want to go near that bundle of important stuff that we don't want to hit. So adduction and internal rotation puts the head of the humerus back into the axilla and takes all the stuff we don't want to hit back there with it. And so at um, anteriorly, right here on the front of the proximal humerus, all we have is skin, muscle, tissue, and the bone. There's nothing there that we have to worry about hitting when we put the arm in that position. I also like to mention that that's the position for insertion. It's not the position it has to stay in um, when the IO is in place, but we do like to have the arm secured to where it will not move past about 45 degrees away or abducted from the body. I want to decrease motion to that joint as much as we can. 
So the first thing you want to do with the arm in that position is place the palm of your hand over the patient's shoulder anteriorly. And when the patient's lying down, you can really push hard, hard on there firmly. And you can feel that bone, that target area underneath the palm of your hand. For many of you, this is the general target area. And for many of you who were in that small percentage that are used to providing proximal humerus access, this may be all you have to do to find that greater tuber. Um, but for those of you who are gaining your confidence, there are a few other steps you can take. You want to put the ulnar aspect of one hand vertically over the axilla. And then place the ulnar aspect of the opposite hand along the midline of the upper arm laterally. When you drop your thumbs down, you're going to identify the vertical line of insertion. And I'm going to show you, I can't see this next slide. So if you can see my fingers, you're going to move smoothly up and down the proximal humerus. And when you do, we, we don't want to do this. Um, I call it itsy bitsy spider where your thumbs are massaging up and down. It's more of a smooth move. And when you move your hands, your thumbs up on the proximal humerus, you're going to come to where they are right now. And you see that is the surgical neck of the proximal humerus right below where that ball starts on the proximal humerus. And that is going to be the landmark that we're looking for. You can see the thumb is in the surgical neck of the proximal humerus right now. And um, some people say it feels like a golf ball on a tee. That's the surgical neck where the golf ball meets the tee. So the thumb is the landmark, that is the surgical neck, and where the X is, that is the insertion site, that is the proximal humerus, and that the greater tubercle of the proximal humerus, and that's the anterior site, and I'm going to show you um, what that site looks like here in a minute. There the thumb looks, you can see it's actually pointing in the right direction for insertion, which we're going to talk about in a second, but the insertion site is one to two centimeters above the surgical neck. I'm a little gracious with my eyeballing. I tested out my one to two CMs above the surgical neck when we were at a cadaver lab one day. And so I'm, I'm best to go with the one. I can be gracious with my eyeballing. So in this picture, um, you can see in the left hand picture that we've landmarked the patient's arms in the correct position. We've landmarked and we've inserted our um, 45 millimeter um, um, 15 gauge IO into the proximal humerus at a 45 degree angle. And I do want to mention that not every IO manufacturer um, landmarks their insertion sites exactly the same way, and not all of them have this insertion angle for their for their intraosseous insertion. So if you do not use the powered IO device, I encourage you to review your manufacturer's instructions or reach out to your clinician to ensure that you're providing the proper angle for that device. But for the um, power-driven IO, we use um, for the patient greater than 40 kilos in the proximal humerus site, it's um, best to use the um, yellow 45 millimeter needle set. And again, that's 45 millimeter in length, uh, but it is a 15 gauge a 304 stainless steel um, needle set. And you're going to insert that at a 45 degree angle to the bone. That's important because that's not going to be a 45 degree angle to the table or, or to the bed that they're lying on, but a 45 degree angle to the bone. And the reason that we do that is because of the pictures that you see to the right. If you can look at that growth plate, that's a really important part of factor in this. Uh, and the growth plate and the part uh, on the other side of the growth plate, the humeral head, the growth plate and the humeral head are very dense. And the humeral head is actually less vascular than the portion of the bone um, where the greater tubercle lies. And that's why we want to insert into the greater tubercle. And the reason we want to go at a 45 degree angle is so we can parallel that growth plate and stay in that highly vascular portion of um, the upper part of the, of the proximal humerus where the greater tubercle is. You can see that in the far right picture. That would be the yes picture. Um, that picture on the far right is the picture that we want. The picture that has uh, the needle set coming in at a 90 degree angle um, that's moving through the growth plate, that would be the no. I don't know why my yes and no didn't flow over, but I want to make sure that's clear. So um, we want to go in at a 45 degree angle and parallel that growth plate. So we are in the highly vascular portion of the bone that has the highest flow rates. There's that bicipital groove we were talking about earlier too on that bone cutout. 
So also, if you remember, we talked about um, there being a lot of uh, marrow in embedded in that um, cancellous bone, and the marrow is very thick. So once we obtain our vascular access, and I want to go back one more slide, you know, you insert at a 45 degree angle here using that 45 millimeter needle set on patients weighing greater than 40 kilos. Um, when you insert that needle set at a 45 degree angle um, into the proximal humerus, you can insert that uh, on the patients greater than 40 kilos until the hub is close to the skin. That's a, another really great benefit of the proximal humerus site. So once you have that IO in place and you can see we've got our um, easy stabilizer in place and there's an easy connect in place and we're providing our normal saline flush. So um, the, the process would be insert the needle set at a 45 degree angle to the bone until the needle set um, rests against the bone. And then you want to ensure you can see at least one black line above the skin if you're using the powered system. As long as you can see at least one black line, then you want to um, um, pull the trigger and power through um, um, in the proximal humerus until the hub is close to the skin. You can stabilize the hub, the plastic hub, with one hand and remove the stylet by turning to the left and put that in your needle dispenser using a one-handed technique with it on a flat surface. Then you apply the um, Easy Stabilizer over that and the Easy Connect. The Easy Connect primes to approximately one ml of normal saline. Before you do this flush, you always want to pull back and see if you have a marrow return just a little bit. You don't have to bring it all the way back up into the tubing, just a flash of marrow return. If you can see that and the needle is stable in the bone, then you, you're you um, pretty assured that it's in. But if you don't have a marrow return, it's okay. In patients who are in cardiac arrest or who have poor blood volume, um, their blood pressure is low, you may not have that flashback of marrow, um, but it's always good to check for it. One thing we know for sure is that if you have no flush, you have no flow. So we're gonna provide this rapid normal saline flush. It's gonna help displace that marrow and provide that channel that we talked about. It's important that you um, provide a five to 10 ml rapid flush in adults and a two to five ml rapid flush in infants and children. Um, and that will really help um, open up that channel for you. And as long as you have your fluids um, running to a pressure bag, you shouldn't have any more trouble um, with your flow rates. But if you slow your fluid rates down because you've resuscitated your patient or you have a lower fluid volume running, maybe you have your, your fluids running on a pump, um, then if your fluid rates slow down or your pump um, alarms, there might be a chance that you would need to provide another rapid normal saline flush to open that channel up again if that marrow kind of creeps in and around the edge of that catheter. Um, also important to note that um, it takes around 30 mLs per hour if you're using a pump or if you're using a dial flow to a pressure bag um, as a KVO rate, about 30 mLs an hour in the adult patient. Um, to overcome the pressure in the medullary cavity and keep that space open. So if you're running a medication that is less than 30 mLs an hour, you may want to think about running more than one thing together if they're compatible or using a carrier fluid. So we talked about using intraosseous vascular access in emergent, um, urgent or medically necessary situations. Um, it's also great when you're in a situation where you are having difficult vascular access or when delays to vascular access can negatively impact care. Um, if you um, have a patient who requires a medication within a certain period of time, that is when intraosseous access can be used as a bridge until you can have more definitive vascular access. It's also really great to prevent multiple peripheral IV attempts. And for your patient who may need a PICC line, a midline, um, or a long dwelling peripheral IV catheter that's placed by ultrasound, for those patients, we really want to spare those veins in the arm, even your renal patients. And that's a great time to use IO access. Um, it helps facil facilitate vein preservation. Last poll, the high jumper. All right, here we go. What tools do you need to advance your training further in IO access? Consider the following policy samples or assistance in drafting, on-site education, virtual education, independent learning modules, something else. <laughs> something else that I couldn't think of, like. <laughs> I'm I don't sure think you covered them all there, but you never know. <laughs> Something else. 
you know what, that's always great when somebody comes up with that something else, because then you're saying, if one person needs it, I know somebody else needs that also. Well, wait, wait till you see the results. We got a number of something else's. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. All right, let's take a look at the results. So 66% really want that on-site education. Yeah. And then 13 said they'd try the virtual and I, and it, you know, I was just one of those things like you just have to get a feel for the, the landmarks and 5% gave us something else. I, I, um, I, I, can, I, I want to know what the something else is and I, I hope that uh, you will put that through on the, um, in your comments when you do your evaluation so that we will know policy samples, assistance in drafting. Um, I think, you know, our company um, has a very ro um, robust built out clinical education team. We provide a significant amount of hands-on and virtual training. We also work with our educators one-on-one -on -one to ensure that policies are written out um, that are consistent with your facilities um, core values and your mission and with manufacturer's guidelines. Um, not everybody's a cookie cutter. So we work one-on-one -on -one with you guys to make sure that um, what you have is consistent with what you need for your company. Uh, and that's really important. It's also important to make sure you're using manufacturer recommendations. And, you know, um, we've been doing a lot of virtual education here at Teleflex. Now. We found out that uh, many of our um, providers were did not have the the distal femur site in their policy. So we're doing a lot of policy revisions right now and we're happy to help anyone on this call with that as well. Well, I think we've gotten to the end of the presentation. Yeah. Shall we do questions and answers? I'm ready. All right. So Drum roll. this is a good one. So we've seen a lot of proning with the COVID patients. So the question here, uh, I'll read it to you, it's quite long, but you imagine proning people in the ICU and how challenging that can be. Um, a ventilated patient had to be turned prone to help with ventilation, certainly appropriate. During the turning, the central line was lost and the vascular access nurse was called to help get access. Because of the large body mass, we were unable to access a vein and needed to get restarted on multiple pressors, like now. What landmark would you use or any suggestions about location for placing an IO? That's a great question right now, and it's very interesting. I have a lot of experience with proning from the pediatric ICU, so I know exactly what you're talking about. And after I received this question on one of our virtual um, webinars with Teleflex, I did a little bit of research because I wanted to make sure I was providing the most up-to-date answer. And I found, you know, there are some beds that actually prone the patient. So I think it would depend on whether you're using a bed to prone your patient and your patient's actually lying um, with their posterior surface on the bed and then the bed turns, or if you're turning the actual patient on onto the their so their body is, is lying actually prone on the bed. Um, I think that that would make a big difference. Um, and it would also be determinant on their body habitus. You know, in, in the pediatric ICU, we had the opportunity that we didn't have to lie our patients because they were smaller, completely prone. We could, we could lie them at an angle a little bit so they were not completely lying on their chest. And in that case, if the patients were smaller, like pediatric patients where you were able to feel a landmark for the proximal humerus, I would think that the proximal humerus may be a good site um, for those types of patients. Otherwise, I'm not sure that the proximal humerus uh, is going to be your answer for that patient. I would have to take that, you know, case by case and look and see how the patient's lying on the bed, how you have them positioned. But we do know, you know, with the tibia insertion, the leg is a little bit more maneuverable. And it may be that you can position the leg in an elevated position to where the IO is um, secured and not resting against anything to where um, there, the IO be compromised. The concern would be if, if something was touching the IO and it caused the, the needle, the catheter or the cannula to move back and forth. In the beauty of the IO, especially with the powered system, is that it creates a perfect hole in the bone and you don't want to lose that perfect hole by the catheter moving back and forth. So you want to protect that area. So as long as the area is protected and you're able to have that site not touching anything, that, that would be the concern. Awesome. 
Here's another oh. interesting one. Uh, just to follow up, Judy, I'll, I'll grab this one. Uh, Got it. Can IO cause osteomyelitis or osteopathies? Osteomyelitis, there um, is clinical li literature documenting osteomyelitis um, with the IO. Um, the literature that I've read and consistent with the proximal humerus site is typically with an IO. Uh, the ones that I have read have not been placed correctly. Um, so that would really go into the um, the IO was not in the in the correct location in the proximal humerus. Um, and similarly with tibia placement, um, and this is a proximal humerus webinar, but sometimes tibia IOs are not placed in the correct location. Um, or um, maybe they're not used with the uh, securement device and that allows that hole to become imperfect. And when the hole's imperfect, um, then there's definitely a chance that um, fluids and medication could leak around the site. There's a very low complication rate again, less than um, 1% on serious complications. And that is a serious complication, <laughs> um, but, it, but it can happen, yes. It's funny that you mentioned the percentage there because uh, I was, working as a nurse on an ED vascular access team where we were implementing ultrasound and uh, the providers there, the medical staff were the only ones that were allowed to use the IO and it was really our model to change the practice so that nurses in the ER could do that at the time that I was working there. Uh, I had experience with IO, et cetera, and they had asked, well, what happens? Can, can someone develop an infection or osteomyelitis from this? And the only article that I could really find good literature review on was one in 2018 that said, you know, it, it pointed out one case and it made the Red person Island. look back to see if there was any other cases. So this is out of BMC infectious disease. So it's open source. Anybody can access right. this. And it said it was such a rare occurrence that they couldn't find anything really well reported in, in commonplace literature. So it is a rare occurrence. And the ones that I've read in literature, the patients have been very ill. And, um, and and there was likely an issue, an issue with placement. Like I said, also um, um, talking about osteomyelitis or osteo osteopathies is that, you know, just remember when you use the IO site, it's a peripheral site and, and you know, many medications and fluids that can be delivered in the peripheral vascular space, like a peripheral IV can be delivered uh, safely at the same dose rate and concentration in the IO space. So when you think about delivery of medications in the IO space, think about your concentration, even though you're getting that peripheral access with central line performance, especially in the proximal humerus, the concentration needs to be at the peripheral peripheral strength. That's a really good point. And that, yeah. and it just to like the peripheral IV, you, you know, she said the central line came out, you want to move things over very rapidly, especially if you have life-saving uh, drugs going. So, you know, uh, you've got some time, but not much. You're going to have to find some deeper access or get those concentrations down. Um, one of our attendees just wanted to put a clarification out. Um, the spring-loaded device, it works on 2.3 kilogram and above. So, yes, and that, that's okay. correct. And that device, um, there's, I want to say that device, the the neo or infant for that device is a manual device, and then there's a pediatric and adult that's spring loaded. That's correct. Okay. And can you expand on why soft bone is not a contraindication for a power driven IO? Yeah, uh, we have literature documenting that it is um, a safe, fast, and effective device. The EZIO needle set, which pairs with the power driver, um, has a double bevel needle that cuts the bone um, at a precise rate. And when it's paired with the power driver, rotating at 1,250 rotations per minute, it creates a perfect hole in the bone. When the cannula is left inside that hole, it completely occludes the hole and that decreases the risk of infiltration and extravasation. And it cuts the hole so precisely, you can actually cut a raw egg, uh, a hole in a raw egg, and the, the hole will be perfect and there are no cracks. Um, and that, that is one of the reasons that the device is so, so safe and it can be used with patients who have soft bones. Absolutely. And there are multiple IO devices on the market, just like I said, and, and everybody has a really robust web page and um, ways that you can contact those manufacturers and the clinicians for those devices. And again, everybody needs to make sure they're using their device the way it's intended to be used. And that's how you're going to get the best success 
um, is um, making sure that you're working with those clinicians for, for whatever device you're using and using it appropriately. So we talked about good access, like accessing the bone, the right space. Um, what does it look like when we're not in the right space? What does an infiltration appear like? That's a great question, um, especially in the proximal humerus, because a lot of times when we're taking care of central lines or peripheral IVs, we look at the site um, right where the right where the catheter is being placed in, and we look for leaking and redness or swelling right at the site. But um, if you have trouble with an intraosseous um, catheter, many times you'll feel the swelling or coolness of the skin behind the behind the um, extremity where the the fluid maybe has pulled to the back of the skin. So you may see a little bit of swelling here. But when you're using an intraosseous um, catheter, it's important not just to check the site for leaking, redness, temperature changes, or swelling, but to put your hand along the side or around behind the extremity and make sure you're checking the full extremity and you're feeling for temperature changes or any fullness or you know what fluid feels like underneath the skin it feels uh, different than normal skin and then always check that against the other arm to make sure it feels consistent with the other arm uh, and then of course always check the distal extremity here's another uh, interesting question so I know we use in the diagram for a lot of people like to show the speed at which medications done from proximal humeral sites are uh, make central vasculature, like that distance and time as it's being flushed. Uh, one question was, is fluoroscopy needed or necessary? And I guess my follow-up to that would be, you know, I think I already know the answer to this, but can you do fluoroscopy through an IO? So um, you, of course, didn't, you do not have to use fluoroscopy when you're placing the IO. We actually did that just to show how fast the medications um, were entering the central circulation and getting to the heart so our patients could see how fast the proximal humerus site worked. Um, you can infuse contrast. If you use the power-driven IO system, you can access that uh, web page, uh, the clinical portion of that manufactured, the Teleflex web page for emergency medicine. And there's a publication that has, uh, that's called the Science of Fundamentals of Intraosseous Vascular Access. And that publication has a list of medications that have been, sa that have been shown in literature to be safely delivered in the intraosseous space. And contrast media is one of those medications. Um, Fluoroscopy, I'm not going to lie to you, I'm not um, a uh, radiology nurse, and I'm not sure if that's delivered by hand. Is that delivered by hand push? I think through those kinds of devices, it would be. So if it's delivered by hand push and you're giving um, contrast dye, um, then certainly contrast dye is on that list of medications to be delivered by a syringe push um, into the intraosseous space, yes. How about if it was on a, a powered, a automated power? That is an off-label question, and anybody who has that question, um, I'm happy to have your personal information and speak to you on a one-on-one -on -one lab, um, level. Um, the um, our um, the powered I/O device um, does not have an indication for power injection. And, um, and um, while there is literature to discuss it, and I can discuss it on a one-on-one, -on -one, I, I can't discuss it on such a large audience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or the FDA would be the, my next phone call. Hello. <laughs> and there is a concern. Uh, People are asking in, uh, in CT. Remember when we're in CT, a lot of times they put our arms over our head. You don't want to do that with an IO in your... No swimmer's views, exactly. Uh, so, no. you know, it's, um, it's you best to that. have... Yeah, best to have that arm secured um, and to put the armband on so everybody knows that you've got an IO in place, especially that proximal humerus IO. You can move about 45 degrees away from the body. And we even, um, for our anesthesiologists, we'll talk to them a little bit more specially and, and independently about how to go to 90 since they're in this position a lot. Um, but if, if the arm comes up much past 45 degrees, there's a chance the IO could come in contact, uh, the acromion process could come in contact with that, with a portion that's not inside the bone. There's a chance that it may become dislodged. And so um, that's why we want to decrease movement of the extremity as much as possible. So really just best to um, secure that device, especially if your patient's alert or there's a chance that the, that the, the shoulder could move around because it's a, it's a pretty mobile joint. Thanks. 
Now the address that you were saying that they could get education, can you tell me that so I can type it in and send it to folks? Yeah, so if, if you use the power driven um, um, IO system, you can access that education at www.ezioeducation. Oh, I'm sorry, hang on, www.teleflex.com forward slash EZIO education. <laughs> Okie dokie. I will send that out to everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. And, then, and then again, if you use a different device, I encourage you to get on their website. I've been on them <laughs> um, and they've got robust education and links to um, receive education for those devices. Are you aware of any legal issues with uh, using IO for placement? No, um, I would say, um, you know, every, every, um, every clinician that uses any type of vascular access should be using vascular access um, per their policy, especially if they're a pre-hospital um, provider, they need to be using it according to their protocols, but every clinician should be providing vascular access um, under the order of a physician or by um, a written protocol that states they can use it without the order of a physician. Um, but as long as you're following your policies or protocols or you're under physician order and you're following manufacturer guidelines or your policy guidelines, then I can't think of any legal impl implications to IO access. Facility is very hesitant to use IO, even in the trauma emergent settings. What suggestions do you have to push this vascular resource into use? Um, education. I think that um, knowing, knowing, knowing. Um, I was just telling Judy and Blake earlier that I'm, I'm back in school and we just got finished learning about knowing that and knowing this and <laughs> Uh, and really knowing knowing more, you know, knowing the theory behind what you're doing, understanding the clinical literature that stands behind it and how other clinicians are using it successfully. And then quite honestly, having one clinician like yourself, um, the person who asked the question, that is gonna be that person that says, I'm gonna learn more about intraosseous access. I'm gonna learn all the literature. I'm gonna become very confident in it. And I'm gonna be the one that brings it to my hospital and teaches other how, others how to use it. And I was that person for my transport team. I went on a flight where I could not provide vascular access for my patient. And the patient had a head injury and needed an airway and they were breathing and alert just enough that we could not um, intubate them, they had to be RSI, and it was the longest 15 minutes I've been, I had been in for a long time, and, and that's when we sought out IO access, we looked at all the devices, and we chose the powered system, and, and so we became that person for our team, and um, I encourage you to do the same, read literature, watch webinars just like this, talk to your physicians, ask them to do the same, uh, make bulletin boards, ask us to come in for education, you know, push out virtual learning and um, and just be that person that makes the change. You know, as a follow up to that, um, another, let's see, who asked this, Lisa, she said um, something else, organizational support to insert IO devices. In her situation, only providers are allowed to. Mm -hmm. And along with what you just said, Amy, it's, People, we need to step up and make those changes because we know yeah. that's a safer it's route. It's peripheral vascular. It's peripheral access. It's for it nurses. Is. It's for respiratory therapists. It's for, for non-licensed yeah. as well. I mean, it's exactly paramedics. I mean, there's some, you know, exactly. You Once miss. you do your first one, it's scary the first time on a breathing patient, a live patient, or even one that's not breathing. But after the first one, it's like, oh my gosh. I, I, got two first. I got two first right off the bat. I did my first IO was in a fully alert patient. So I got that done right off the bat. But even though I brought it to my team, I was very nervous the first time I did it. Um, but you're right, the very after I did it the first time, I did not hesitate to to do it the second time. And again and again, I saw its life-saving capacities. And I think that you're right, we need to move toward nurse-led or you know, clinician. Uh, non-physician-led insertions on the IO, and, and typically the, um, the physicians are busy doing other procedures. Everybody, not one person shouldn't be doing all the life-saving procedures. It should be a team effort, and vascular access should be at the hand of the, the non-physician clinician at the bedside. Even IHI says we need to work to the full extent of our licensure. 
Yes. And physicians should do what only physicians can do. There's so many things, you know, they can Agreed. do it. We should be we should be doing those other ancillary jobs. On the other side of that too is, um, you know, like the argument that I came across when I was trying to bring IO to the bedside for non-physician staff was, um, well, you know, it's liability. You know, we're we're they're trained more as physicians that they 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 can bear that responsibility. I'm like, but nurses and other people take PALS or ACLS every two years. And in a good institution, you're getting one of those every year. Um, we're getting more hands-on time with drills in those courses than any other provider staff in the hospital. Like, mm -hmm. if, even if we're not inserting in people. So it's like, again, routine, repetition, that's the key to the success, so. Agreed, and, and typically the clinicians that are at the bedside, the team of clinicians at the bedside, whether it be a nurse, a respiratory therapist, um, or if you're pre-hospital, different levels of EMS um, participant, you know, who are, who's at the, at, at, in the ambulance, you know, you know um, much more about the patient than, than the physician who either you're calling into or if you're at the bedside, the physician who, who um, is in, um, over the medical care of the patient because you've been there all day and you know how many times you've either tried peripheral access or um, quite honestly, you know, I, we, uh, Judy and I were talking about this today. I um, was not a fan of ultrasound guided peripheral access when I was at the bedside and I learned later it was because I was not doing it the right way <laughs> until my colleague Amy Barden and uh, Tim Spencer taught me how to do it the right way and I think if I had known how to do it I, I probably would have done it better <laughs> but uh but you know you really shouldn't um, ask a clinician to do something that they're not skilled at and it really does take a, sk a skilled clinician to fit in an ultrasound guided uh, peripheral access um, or put in a pick line or a midline or um, and those can take time and IO access is something that the bedside um, nurse or clinician can um, can take care of very quickly and and make sure the patient's cared for. This is a question that I, I love because um, I've used it for this purpose, but renal patients with AV fistulas, any contraindications for the humeral head on the same side as the AV fistula? So if, if, as long as the AV fistula is, is you know, down in the arm and it's not over the site, if, if the fistula runs over the site, if you can see any portion of any device that runs over the proximal humerus site um, and, and likely there would be a scar there, um, that would be a contraindication if you see any type of device um, on the site. Um, otherwise, any device that's in, in the arm, the lower arm, is not a contraindication. You know, certainly if there's a mastectomy scar on the left side, if there's an AV fistula on the left side, um, and you're and you want to and you're standing at the left side. If you have the ability to go to the right side, that's probably best practice. Um, but if you're in a code and you can't get over there, or there's a scar on the other side, then that's not a general contraindication. You're not really affecting the veins necessarily that they would be looking for for further creation or you know flow, et cetera. You know, you're yeah, accessing. The, you know, it goes the bone, the the vasculature that runs from the bone. You know, it leaves the bone, the bone almost immediately. If you've ever had a chance to come to one of our cadaver labs and we we cut the tissue back a, away from the bone, um, and you can see when we uh, when you flush fluid that has dye in it in, into the into the proximal humerus or any bone for that matter, you can see it immediately come out around the bone and, and move into central circulation um, and into the vasculature that feeds into the to the subclavian vessel and directly into the heart. What is the best way to attach your secondary set or your extension set to the IO device? So um, most IO devices, um, with the exception, uh, not all the manual devices, but most IO devices come with some sort of little pigtail like this, and they're all universal. And I like to mention that um, you know that this is a universal device, and I know that the the spring loaded device that's on the market also has a universal, and that's important because. Um, IO devices are, they're not cheap, <laughs> so, uh, just like other forms of vascular access. So when you open this up, if this falls on the ground, um, just know that you can attach your IV fluids directly to the hub of, 
have an IO. Um, all the IO devices on the market have a standard um, lure lock hub on top and you can put your fluids right to them or you can open up one of your pigtails and attach to it. But the benefit of this is that it has a right angle and that it's fully articulating. So this IO device, what did you ask me again? I was talking about it. <laughs> I mean, the other part is I, I know with a lot of IO driven devices that they manufacture like a securement device for it. So I guess how would you, yeah, if you don't mind demonstrating for the audience. So the securement device for the IO um, is, is some, you're right, it is important to talk about and it's, um, the important thing about the securement device for the power driven um, device is that you put it on before you put the connector on. So when you put the IO in, typically we'll like hurry up and rush and put our connector in place. Um, and this is in, in the package for the power driven IO. Um, and that's different in this. So it's a little bit um, to get used to put the dressing on and then the and then the connector locks it in place. But the great thing about the power driven IO dressing is that it has this telescoping center on it. So um, with the power driven IO, there are three different lengths of needle sets. They're all 15 gauge um, 304 stainless steel. And that allows the clinician to choose the proper length. And you can actually ensure you have the proper length prior to insertion. And I have um, a bone block right here and I'll show you this is the yellow 45 millimeter needle set that we were talking about earlier when we were going into the proximal humerus site. And I, I just used it in a bone. You wouldn't normally run your fingers across it when you're taking care of a patient, but I've been using it all week for education. Uh, uh -huh. So you can see it has, it has lines on it. Uh, usually you just hold it by the plastic hub. So as you can see the line that's closest to the hub, that's the black five millimeter line. And that's the one that's um, it's most important because you wanna be able to see that before you, pull the trigger and insert through the through the medulla through the um, cortex. So this attaches with a magnet, as you can see, and then you just need to hold this in place. I usually hold it like this and then pull the cap straight off. So I would have already determined that my patient needs an IO and then I would have already landmarked my proximal humerus site appropriately. And then I would cleanse the skin with whatever my hospital use gloves. It's an aseptic technique. The supplies are sterile, but the um, technique itself is aseptic. So I would have on gloves and I would cleanse with what my hospital uses for um, typically peripheral insertion. And then here, I'm gonna insert through skin and touch bone and ensure I can see at least one black line and I can. And then you wanna do one continuous insertion. That's important because you wanna make sure you can feel the loss of resistance in the lower extremities. In the proximal humerus, we're gonna go all the way until the hub is close to the skin. As you can see, I'm at a 90 degree angle, so I'm likely in the lower extremities, but for this um, purpose, of this demonstration, we're gonna insert at a 90 degree angle into this bone and not the 45 that's um, recommended for proximal humerus insertion. Okay, hub is close to the skin. Hold the hub, remove the driver. That's important in case the patient has soft bones. Lefty Lucy takes out this stylet and then remember I said, put this on a flat surface and the stylet goes right in and you can put that into a larger needle dispenser. And then here's what I was talking about. The dressing goes on first, unlike an IV, a peripheral IV, where you would have um, a lot of blood flowing back, the marrow is much thicker. And so you don't have to worry about it um, rushing back quite as quick as, um, as a peripheral IV. So we're gonna put this, lock that in place, pull our dressings. I've used this dressing quite a bit. They're actually very sticky, but um, I've been doing a lot of virtual education this week, so this has been my dressing du jour. Um, I'm gonna pull back just a little bit and see if I can get a marrow flash right there, and then I'm gonna flush it with my five to 10 mLs of normal saline. And this has a universal Robert site connector on the end of it that's a needleless connector, so you don't have to worry about anything flowing back from there. Another thing that I like to mention, and this is a little trick you can take back um, is that there's a little tab on the edge right there that a lot of people don't know about. And that's a good first pull tab that lets you know uh, that you've got a safety against a first pull. There's one on both sides so that you don't have to put an extra piece of tape on there. Uh, so just to follow up on the something else part of the polling was uh, 
Uh, I went to a cadaver lab to learn IO and the humoral head. It was awesome. Uh, that was the something else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, cadaver labs are awesome. Um, you know, anytime you have the opportunity to work on um, real human tissue, especially at a cadaver lab where the tissue is, has not been embalmed um, and you, it's just like you're taking care of a patient. There's nothing that will increase your confidence level, um, you know, as much as practicing, 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 working with experts in the field on landmarking and, and having the ability to, to ask questions like you guys can today. That, um, really helps um, increase your confidence. For Teleflex Cadaver Labs, um, we're hopefully going to get those um, going back in July. You know, we had to put a lot of them on hold because of the coronavirus, and we're getting many of those rescheduled in July. So please, that same website that Judy put up earlier, that EZIO Education webpage, there's a link to our Cadaver Lab program on that page, and you can go on there and see if there's one scheduled for, for, your, for your area. Um, and please know that we are, um, we've actually uh, be patient with us. We've had to cut the number down of attendees that we're allowed to have because we're practicing social distancing at our cadaver labs. So we'll do every effort to get you in, but um, but we're going to have to probably be pretty stringent with the numbers that we're allowed to, uh, to come in the lab. But we're hoping to get back out and start teaching again soon. Do you guys have any business plans that you've created that you share with folks that want to get this into practice? We do have... Um, um, not sh really sharing business plans, but we do have some customers um, or providers of IO access that, that purchase the power driven device that have access to cadavers at their home facilities. And maybe they even have physicians who do routine cadaver labs for skills days at their hospitals or through EMS agencies. There's an EMS agency out in Texas that has a cadaver lab. I can't remember if it's monthly or quarterly, but they have a very robust program. And um, that's important because um, we can provide what we call in-service with tissue education, where um, one of our educators comes out and teaches on someone else's tissue, not our tissue. So we um, are able to provide that type of education. And in that way, we help them, just like you're talking about, not really provide a business plan, but you know, definitely um, help them uh, schedule their day to where um, it gets um, the, the highest level of education provided. We've been very we have, successful down in Florida doing that. We have a provider in Florida who has access to tissue. We've had some, a beautiful lab down there last year. Perfect. So Gina asked, how can we get our vascular access team to be trained and validated? Um, I think Amy went over a lot of things about doing your, doing your due diligence and verifying the different devices and the benefits and then contact those providers. Yeah. I know everyone that has an IO device, a vascular access device, has an education department. Um, so yes, the in, we, the in, yeah, and it's important because manufacturers, while we can provide the education, we really don't provide competence, and so we leave that to um, the leaders at your at your at, in, with an education at your facility or your hospital to ensure competence. So we developed a program called the Train the Trainer program for our IO device, and it's uh, great because really, if you're just starting out with IO with the power device. Um, go ahead and call. It's great to start out with virtual learning. And then when you're ready for us to come in, we can come in and provide some hands-on education. After you have, you know, used the IO some for you know, the first maybe six months and you've developed some super users um, that use the IO. And just like Judy saying, someone who really believes in the IO and use it more, is, uses it often and has a confidence level. For those providers, we can come in and we can provide a train the trainer course. And that makes your super users uh, uh, trainers for your hospital where um, they can train new nurses who come in or maybe your new resident group before July or routine skills days. And that really, Judy, that really just kind of balloons out and it just layers on that education and confidence. And to add to that, nobody should be putting in a vascular access, a, doing a sterile procedure in an emergent, urgent situation. That's nobody, true. Never. I mean, if you're getting called to place that urgent central line, be it in the neck, the chest, the groin, or the arm, don't do it. Get a bridge device. It takes you two, uh, five seconds to put in an IO, stabilize that patient, go back and put all your sterile doodads out, 
and get that yeah. line in without that stress and pressure of the patient trying to die. So, and the correct line for that patient, not just the one right. that somebody grabbed off the shelf or out of the closest cart. You know, you can really say, do I need a central line that can dwell for an extended period of time that has protected technology? You know, there's a lot of different types of central um, catheters, midlines, pick lines, um, long dwelling peripheral IVs, and everybody um, who, who provides vascular access, all clinicians who provide vascular access should understand the differences in those devices. It's a beautiful bridge. It's a bridge to the right line. And I agree. I've even used it on a patient that is a vascular path to where there's nothing left to do. And this patient, um, chronic sickle cellar, came in and, and said, no, 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 I, you know what, I'm, <laughs> I'm not in full crisis. I just want that drill thing. So, um, that's pretty sad. Well, that, yeah, I mean, but you know, it's with amazing. The, with the but that, they had that many sticks in the past. How horrible oh. that they had to have so many sticks until they found that, um, that that was their answer. And, um, and you know, if your patient um, doesn't have any veins visible right now because they're hypotensive or they're hypothermic, whatever their clinical um, considerations are, um, you know, if you warm them, you put in an IO, you give them some fluids, it doesn't mean that that's not going to change in the next 30 minutes to an hour. You may be able to put in a peripheral yeah. IV, you know, True. at some point. But and while the IO, yeah, while yeah. it can dwell for 24 hours, we know most of the time it doesn't because it, it's a good bridge and it provides that time for access. You had a perfect uh, segue. Kathleen's met, um, question to us was, I thought they could only dwell for 24 hours in the U.S. And you are right. <laughs> it has not changed. <laughs> it has not changed. So you know, the dwell time for, um, for I, I think most IO devices here in the U.S. is, is a 24 hour dwell time here. Um, and that's in the U.S. and Canada. And then in the EU, it's 72 hours. And it's not a different device. Um, it's just um, a different um, governing body making decisions. So I'm um, here in the U.S. it's going to be a 24-hour dwell. <clears throat> here's, a, here's an interesting question. So not that I've ever used this device, but the Lucas compression device. Um, Great question. Have you seen any issues with uh, dislodgement of the proximal humeral site when using an automated compressor like that? I have not personally seen any and I've not received any questions on the clinical call line for it. Uh, um, and I've not seen any literature to support it. We do work with the manufacturers of both of the main um, um, compression, automatic compression devices. Um, the number one thing that you need to remember when you're working with those devices is um, you need to ask yourself which comes first, the CPR device or the IO. I like to say it's like the chicken or the egg. So if you've already got your IO device um, in place in the proximal humerus, and then you wanna put the automatic compression device on, uh, the number one thing you need to remember is to not move the patient's arms over their head. And both of those devices put that in their instructions for use. So instead of bringing the arms up and over for this device, just bring them from lower to this device. The great thing is we just said that, you know, it's great to secure the extremity and they both have securement devices. So secure like this for this device and down by the arms for the one that moves around your chest. For the one that you put around your chest that has a strap around the chest and you roll the patient to the side to get them on that device, you should roll to the unaffected side. Um, if you have the mechanical CPR device in place first and then want to put the IO in place, then you need, it would be um, best practice to take the arm out of the securement device and put it in the position that we discussed, the adducted internally rotated position prior to placing that IO. Um, otherwise, the angle is going to be different because it's not in the position that we suggest for placement. So the angle will be different. Um, if you're very secure in your proximal humerus IO placement, you may be able to do it, but um, best practice would be to put it in that adducted internally rotated position. <clears throat> Perfect. We're down to our last question for you. You might get to get up and have a, a sip of water here in a second. <laughs> so Joanne writes, she was called to place two 16 gauges uh, PIVs in mm -hmm. an OB patient that was obese on hemodialysis and they were concerned about hemorrhage. 
would an IO be a consideration for a just-in-case IV? So you can place it for medically necessary. Um, and that would be at the physician's discretion if he felt like the IO um, was needed in that case. The great thing about the IO is that you can place it so rapidly, you can put it at the bedside for just in case instead of putting it in the patient for just in case. Um, so we had a, a patient that I took care of one time that was having seizures and the seizures um, were causing the patient to pull out all of the all of the vascular lines um, just because the patient was you know not um, mentating correctly and so we did have the IO at the bedside as the just in case line but we didn't place it until we needed it um, and that's the great thing about IO you can obtain vascular access in seconds um, but of course it is um, available for medically necessary patients and if the physician asks you to place it um, the great thing in that in that instance is that marrow clots really quick. While that's not advantageous when you're ready to take uh, marrow to the to the lab <laughs> and you have to run it down there quickly, it's great um, for a patient that um, you're worried about bleeding because <laughs> the marrow clots really rapidly. <laughs> true. true. <laughs> well, Amy, this has been a wonderful webinar. We thank you for your time. Appreciate your patience. You guys be safe out there. Thank you so much. Thank you.